uh, welcome our second keynote speaker, uh, Sophie. Uh, I've known Sophie uh, for a few years now, and uh, you might have seen her around on Twitter. She is uh, bouncing around in our Discord as well. Um, but you might have bumped into her in different ways. Uh, the way that I've uh, predominantly know her is from her research in the security space and also her experience on the CTF circuit. Uh, she came out of uh, RPI sec, I believe, and uh, we were just chatting a bit before the call and uh, her active team is still um, looking for how to optimize points and, and sort of the CTF tracking website. So they're um, optimizing which events that they play in so that they can up their rankings and things. So it's great to still see active in that. And uh, her topic here um, is a, a pretty interesting one. And I don't know quite um, how to phrase it, but um, I, I feel it's it's almost like you don't have to listen to what Sophie's going to say, but you probably should listen to what Sophie's going to say. And um, with that, uh, I think I'll turn it over to our keynote. Thanks, Sophie. Hey, everyone. All right, we'll share my screen here. All right, so that should be working for everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so my title of this talk is Hardware Implants in the Trouble with 5G. Um, but it actually stems from uh, some previous work I did with Lawfare last year. So kind of the history of all of this. Um, last year when a bunch of papers came out about, you know, using different hardware infrastructure specifically for 5G in the UK, a lot of countries were talking about how they can mitigate risk and that sort of thing from a security perspective for it. And of course they were wrong. So uh, that's when uh, me and a few friends started doing a lot of publications in the space, but um, we'll talk more about that later. So yeah, I've done work with DARPA, um, OSIRIS labs here in New York where I'm based. Um, they hold Seesaw and that sort of thing. Um, I worked with a fort for a while. Um, and right now I own and operate a company called Margin Research uh, here in the city as well. All right, so everyone's heard of the big hack. This is kind of unwinding the story all, all the way back to the beginning. And the interesting thing about the big hack is no one really talked about hardware security before it. And so we know in short that the hack claimed that Chinese backdoored a bunch of chips, um, specifically through Supermicro that um, reached almost 30 US companies. So pretty big companies and they were all backdoored. Um, and these backdoors were inserted during manufacturing time. And this is an example that I loved. I think people probably saw this Twitter um, post, but showing the Chinese backdoors next to a potentially US backdoor. Note that ours is bigger and better, um, <laughs> which is very fitting for the conference. Um, but the real question that I started asking is where do hardware implant threats come into play in the general stack of security? So if we try and break down security to different la layers of you know, a computer or a system, we get stuff from all, all the way from the data layer. So, you know, your username and passwords all the way down to the hardware layer. And it turns out we're pretty good at um, doing security for everything else but hardware. Um, so from a security standpoint, a company can produce uh, the software set of these components with strong verification properties. So we, can, we know how to do good crypto now. Uh, Apple can develop um, a secure boot which is cryptographically secure and provable. Um, a user can verify an application they've downloaded from the internet by taking a hash of the file and saying, okay, this hash matches the hash of a different program that I know someone's looked at and said it was secure. So, um, you know, besides the firmware, most software can be loaded onto the device at a later stage even. Um, and that also helps with security properties, right? So you can get your device and then in-house, you can put the software you want on it. Um, and this can be done outside of the supply chain's untrusted environment. Um, and obviously the supply chain would affect the hardware, maybe the firmware. So the point of this is that we have a semi-automated solution to verify a system software uh, components. Um, we can push patches that get to everyone um, and that sort of thing. And so we really suck at hardware security. And the real question is why is hardware verification fallen under the radar? for so long. And I think the main reason for this is that it's fallen mostly outside of a company's control. So unless you're Apple, you're really not doing anything at the hardware layer uh, to do design, parts of manufacturing. Um, and even Apple ships out a lot of their 
manufacturing to different companies. And so why is this a problem, right? So we have general threats of hardware, um, you know, security. I've kind of broken them up into different components. Um, the last being, I think, you know, the most dangerous. So for more backdoors or implants, um, so bug doors, things that are kind of at a very deep, deep layer that a, a company doesn't really look at, but they're also still software. Um, but hardware implants are more fun, right? So we have our external, um, you know, like packets, nothing on network cables, that sort of thing. It's been around for a long time. Physical peripherals, which I'm sure everyone's looked at um, for a time. So you can do key, keystroke logging over USB, firewall DMA, the whole gamut. Um, and this does um, rely on external, on external components and access to the system. And so it's a bit, it's a bit more obvious when things like this happen. And then we have our more complex methods of hardware implants. So we have PCB implants. So we can have the addition of chips or modifications. And this is where the alleged supermicro attack falls into uh, place. And we have stock implants as well. So basically system on a chip, and then there's you know something else inside of this other chip. Um, it's not unreasonable that you could put a, a complete radio system inside a microcontroller inside the same package. Um, They've already made chips this way. Packaging things together saves on money. Um, so there's a lot you can do there as well. So if we look at the Bloomberg hack, uh, you know, the gray are off white in color. Um, it looked like a signal conditioning coupler. And, and I won't read it all, but this was the exact description of the Bloomberg implant, which you know we later find out was copy and pasted from an email with someone who is describing a theoretical situation. Uh, but a signal conditioning coupler is pretty common on boards. So for those of you who know about hardware, you're like, yeah, of course, every board's going to have a signal conditioning coupler. They're passive components. Um, they look pretty benign. And you, it's enough physical space that you could hide something um, pretty complex inside of it. And so when looking at this, um, I started looking at different categories of um, how we can do implants. So um, one method I call a sandwich, but I think it's kind of funny. Um, and, and a lot of this was also discussed in Bunny's talk at um, Blue Hat Security, so Microsoft con Microsoft's conference. Um, and so, yeah, we have a wafer level uh, chip scaling package on the left, um, which provides solder and connects directly between the device and the motherboard um, end of the product. And so we have uh, through silicon vias, everything, you know, it's all connected and it's very complex. Um, however, it's also extremely hard to see um, because everything is now kind of 3D mounted in these 3D packages. Uh, it contains two or more chips stacked vertically. Um, and this is good because it occupies less space um, and provides greater connectivity. Um, however, you can't see anything that's going on. And so, you know, we're assured that some wiring is connected to certain parts of maybe the graphics card or the substrate. However, there's no easy way to prove this. Uh, vertical connects between two, uh, the body of the chips. Um, and so we could have something like a man in the middle uh, silicon attack where we add something in this uh, sandwich. So before or after. Um, optically inspection is almost impossible. The only difference that you'd notice if you do this sort of attack is there would be a, a slightly visible seam in the package. Um, however, this is normal usually. Uh, so there's usually a seam because people are too cheap to actually you know, connect it. Um, and so it wouldn't be that easy to opt optically see. And from an X-ray perspective, it's still pretty difficult. Um, the, solder, uh, the solder balls mask anything that you'd really see. Um, and there'd be no real footprint to the addition of this package substrate. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, the pros of this sort of attack uh, it's logically easier than wire bond implants or that sort of thing because you're just inserting something in there. Um, and you're targeting the chip sold in chip form. So there's no real package you have to RE. Um, you don't have to actually understand how things are wired. You're just adding something on top. Um, and this sort of uh, chip is actually really common in mobile devices. And so you can be guaranteed that if you try and do this attack and then lay it over a huge set of devices, it could be uh, done in mobile. And now servers as well uh, commonly have this sort of chip. Um, it's a big graphics card thing. Um, 
probably because it saves on time and space. But uh, yeah, so the, the problem with this attack um, is that it's actually pretty complicated to do, right? So you have to understand how to create a through silicon via um, addition, and you have to know how you could develop that sort of attack. Um, and it would actually cost around 100K or so to carry this attack out. Um, just to get the equipment set up that you need, um, you need access to a mid mid end sort of fab. Um, it's not something you could do in your basement. And one thing I thought was hysterical when I started looking into this was Intel had unveiled a new 3D uh, chip packaging design, which is great for them. You know, uh, it's much more efficient and that sort of thing. They had a section for circuit security in their uh, like blog post uh, spec breaking about it. 3D integration can achieve security through obscurity. I kid you not, that's literally on their page. Um, that was their solution to security. So we're kind of screwed if people go after chips like this. And then of course we have the ad, which is where um, the Bloomberg attack came in. So it's, you know, literally you have a motherboard, you just stick something on the board. Um, this can be a legitimate component. So you're just moving around the component to a different area. Um, and yeah, so there, I think this is pretty self-explanatory, but it's pretty difficult to, um, even though you're physically seeing something different, uh, determine that it's malicious or not. Uh, you can have an ad inside of a package. So um, flash memory packages are legitimate, but you can still add something that's maybe too large or configured slightly differently. Um, there's something you can do um, as well called, this is what I call the swap, but you could add shadow memory um, this way or enlarge the um, SPIEE prom. Um, so it's stuff that you know works as intended. However, now you have additional space to do other things, um, you know, to modify sister controlled behavior, um, emulate system controllers with a micro FPGA. So it's not actually physically doing it, you're emulating it. Um, and this makes it difficult to detect. So in Trammell's um, uh, hardware implant uh, demo that he gave at CCC, um, this is the method that he used. So he actually emulated certain behavior so that when you were trying to debug uh, the area around his implant to see if he was acting weird, it would actually emulate the proper behavior when it knew someone was listening. Um, and so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I won't go too much into this, but this is another example of um, a PCB level attack so from the University of Michigan. Um, and this was kind of like the ultimate attack proof of concept. So um, they kind of went right after the silicon. Um, however, there's other, you know, I think much more um, effective ways to go after things like this. And that would be, you know, editing the netlist. So if you have access to, uh, to that, you can edit the netlist and it's kind of game over. Oh gosh. Okay. I hate Apple. It does it every time I give uh, Zoom presentations. Um, all right, so yeah, you can edit the netlist. Uh, you can do things like ma mask editing. So this is a problem when you have third uh, party suppliers. Um, so kind of taking a step back. Uh, one thing that's very common with these systems is you have your company that designs a netlist. Maybe they design some, some more elements to it. They pass that off to a contracting company to do the development of the actual device. And that company itself then sends it off to, you know, a dozen other companies to do part acquisition, to do um, different parts of the uh, the process to build it up. And so you end up having an extremely large supply chain for even the most simple uh, chip or motherboard. And so even any one of these companies can do um, different sort of things to, to attack. But um, yeah, you can do mask editing, uh, dope pant tampering has also been proven to uh, be malicious. Um, one interesting attack that I came across was the spare cell rewiring, um, which I hadn't thought of before. However, uh, there's a legitimate reason to insert additional empty slots, um, like spares, if you will, into things like ASICs. Uh, the reason that is, this is true is ASICs are expensive. And so instead of you know, realizing you're wrong at the end of development, and having to rebuild an entire ASIC from scratch, you insert empty slots 
Um, so you can later, you know, rewire the spare logic that you have. Um, but it turns out you now have spare logic on your board. And so um, you have to be very certain that your ASIC only does what it's supposed to do, which is a hard thing to prove. Um, and there's other sorts of attacks I won't go into, but if, if people want to know um, later, you can go through them. Uh, and so this is just show, showcasing the different stages of uh, development uh, for these chips. And so to ch challenge two attackers, so if you want to do this sort of thing, um, any single contractor who attempts to modify something at each stage should be stopped through the manufacturing process. So there should be checks at each stage to make sure that nothing's been altered. And that's why it's most effective to potentially edit the IP list or the net list um, at the start. So you don't have to deal with all of this. Um, however, my next question to them would be, you know, how great are the manufacturing checks at each stage? Um, but uh, we'll never know. I guess that's just showing that. Um, one thing I, I really like to point out here is, and I've looked at a lot of boards, the real problem with detecting any of these hardware attacks, like the ad or a swap sort of attack, um, is that oftentimes companies will attack themselves or add components, swap out components for cost. Uh, so lower cost um, allows them to, you know, take that extra money off the top and store it on the side. Um, so there's a lot of counterfeit parts being used uh, where the manufacturing company is just profiting off of that small difference between the part cost, you know, like those two cents really add up. Um, but then also it's a sourcing issue, right? So if you're trying to build a board by a certain deadline for a company and you have two parts that act when you put them together as one part, but the part you really want to put there uh, would take six months to be shipped from Brazil or something like that. Uh, you're gonna go with that uh, addition of those two parts instead uh, to speed up the process. And so in general, most of the time when I see different parts being used um, or swapped out, it's because of this reason. Uh, so you have to prove the malicious intent as well. This is an example of something I came across when um, I was reversing some boards after the Supermicro case uh, came out, just showing that between boards, so this is the same model, uh, between boards they had two different parts. So yeah, you know, for proprietary reasons, I just really close up screenshot of these uh, two pieces, but you can see the numbers are different. So it's different parts. Um, and so this is just an example of something I found that I'm like, you know, it's probably not benign. It's probably just a, a cost problem. So, I mean, what's the company supposed to do against this? You could have a representative sit in the factory and make sure uh, that the, these companies aren't doing these sort of things, but um, that'd be a whole lot of effort. Um, but yeah, so in general, a distributor makes about uh, three to 5% on a chip, which is not a whole lot. So hardware margins are, are pretty low. So if they can inject three to 5% of fake chips in also, so chips that may have um, these swapped out parts or things like that, uh, they double their profits, right? So every small percentage matters for them. Um, all right, so this is kind of going over the numbers again. Um, looking at the cost of an uh, to an attacker for different types of attacks. So um, this was taken from Buddy's uh, Blue Hat talk as well, which I, I highly recommend watching. Um, so as we can see here, wire body implants are cheaper to do, even though they're harder to perform. Um, so I put together this uh, kind of diagram, mostly just to show the different types of attacks against difficulty levels. So it's very hard to perform or to be in a position to perform a mask edit, a netlist edit, uh, the good sort of edits you'd want to do if you didn't want to be detective. Um, and it's mostly hard because of access, right? So it's not hard to physically edit the netlist, but it would be hard to get access to do that. And it's also very hard to detect um, a backdoor when it's edited at this level. Um, so yeah. And so at the end of the day, when you're looking at these boards, and, and I had a, a lot of boards come through um, right after the Bloomberg case came out. You know, maybe they were it was fake, but uh, it did help business, so that's good. Um, 
But yeah, so one thing that was a big takeaway is that inspecting for something that exactly appears, uh, like what the Bloomberg article described, is very, very ineffective. Um, it doesn't actually do what they want. So our solution was inspect everything here, you know, even down to this, uh, this layer. Um, and so these are some methods that we performed when we were looking at boards. So you can follow traces. Um, and 99% of the time, you're not going to have the specification of the board, either from the um, supplier, so from Supermicro, but also from the manufacturer, right? So the manufacturer has parts or components of the board that are proprietary, and they're not going to share those specs. So what you have to actually do is reverse out the net list of the board um, and visually inspect things based on that and, and kind of try and do a, a net list matching between boards um, over time. One idea I actually had here, if people have PhDs they want research ideas for, um, like an open CV thing or something like that to image the board and lift off the net list automatically, um, which I think would be pretty useful. Um, but it turns out there's not a lot of tooling out there for hardware verification. And I think that'd be a neat one. All right, so we were, of course, looking for the addition of a, a component inside of an IC or an integrated circuit. Um, and so at a certain point, you have to look at x-rays. Um, and because of the nature of these um, ships, you actually have to do you know, horizontal and vertical. Um, you can start shaving off taps of the chips and you know, taking pictures as you shave off layers. But um, for this one, we just did side and top. Um, and here again, you just have to visually inspect where the wires are connecting. Uh, a different thing that I think is a very useful trick uh, when you're looking for um, swapped out components. So in the case for um, Tremel Hudson's CCC backdoor, what he did is he actually added, uh, re re replaced a passive component with an active one. And so one pretty useful method is to just see, okay, I have this entire board. What are all the active components on it? And then from there you can say, okay, are any of these active components um, weird? Like, should they be passive? Uh, and that's kind of a good binary check you can do. I mean, all of these methods to, to look at boards are destructive which I think is a separate problem. We'll talk about that later. Um, i talk about that. Um, all right, so uh, this is just going through Trammell's um, uh, demo of his uh, backdoor, which is kind of cool. So he's based in here in New York as well. Um, and so uh, the cool thing about his thing, which I had mentioned was, um, doing uh, different checks on the board. So, you know, reading flash chips, um, replacing uh, the flash chip, um, watching the SPI bus. Um, none of those techniques, which people traditionally use for hardware reverse engineering or to figure out if things um, are acting up, uh, revealed the presence of his backdoor. Um, and I think that just shows um, why detection is so hard. Because all he did was replace passive um, with an active component. All right, so um, one thing I also wanted to mention before we move on to a different topic is uh, the fact that automation is difficult in this uh, hardware verification as well. So unlike software, when you can reverse out a pro whole program, maybe hack it up, and then you can take the hash of that program and say, okay, I know this one's good or bad, and then just check over a series of programs with hardware, you can completely destroy a board, you know, x-ray the whole thing. Um, and you could say, okay, this definitely is good. None of those security properties can really apply to other boards coming off the line. So you maybe you just got a good one. You know, maybe there's only one board on the on the line that's bad. Um, and so it's it's pretty hard to um, translate your security pr uh, properties that you've reversed out uh, to other boards. So this brings us to the general topic of supply chains. Um, and so we all have heard of you know, the Kaspersky uh, lab supply chain issue, right? So the US government, you know, in their brilliance realized that you know, we really shouldn't be using Kaspersky antivirus in government, um, government computers. 
And the reason for that is that, you know, it's sourced in Russia and there's probably um, something sketchy going on in the supply chain, we don't know. So it's safer not to. Um, and so that's the software supply chain example. Um, another example uh, that came out, which I thought was, was pretty cool last year, um, was Shadow Hammer. So um, I talk about this a little later on, but again, it was a supply chain issue coming out of ASUS, um, a mix of uh, software updates and just software. Um, and so uh, they were able to come down in the middle of the update process and the supply chain or the, you know, the sourcing of these updates and software were um, malicious. But where is the good, you know, hardware uh, supply chain issue? So, of course, really popular topic last year, we have Huawei. So, everyone's probably heard the name Huawei, but uh, just to kind of go over their basics. So, they're a huge telecommunication company. Um, they're the second largest phone manufacturer after Apple globally. Um, they're also subsidized heavily by the Chinese government. And so one thing that's interesting when we first started looking at Huawei stuff was they offered the cheapest base stations by 30%. And the reason they can offer the cheapest base stations by 30% is the Chinese government subsidized them $100 billion. Uh, them and all of their suppliers and stuff, $100 billion. Uh, to produce these base stations at the low cost they can. Now, I was talking to uh, the Verizon CSO actually, and he was telling me that the interesting thing about this, and there is a few numbers out on this now, um, the entire global market for 5G is estimated to only be 70 billion. And so the Chinese government's going into this knowing that they're going to lose 30 billion, even if they manage to get the entire market uh, for 5G. And so this is an old slide, but I like the picture and it just shows the division that uh, the debate for the supply chain or the sourcing has caused. So obviously this is wrong now, right? So England uh, should be blue there. Um, Mexico as well has been um, toying with getting some, uh, some Huawei base stations in their country. And so I, I like the slide, but the US kind of came out pretty strongly against um, Huawei 5G. So obviously people probably recognize uh, the guy on the left, Ajit Pai. So you know, this big recess mug, he was like, absolutely not. We're not getting uh, Huawei base stations in our country. Um, and we have, we came out with a very strong statement against it. Um, Huawei as well as ZTE. Um, ZTE for people who don't know, uh, is a company that works very closely with Huawei. However, they sell surveillance equipment. So IP cameras, um, and other things as well. Oh, and then one thing to note here is that we're not saying companies can't buy, we're just saying that the US government can't as of right now um, for Huawei. For ZTE, no one can buy ZTE. And so the real debate for Huawei is broken up into several different categories. So obviously we have the just purely technical issues potentially with the equipment, but then we also have a, a larger national security issue. So Chinese companies are beholden to their government. We know this because they've passed public laws that you know, apply nationwide um, to regulate this. So there was a national intelligence law in 2017 and the regulation on inter internet security supervision and inspection by public security organs in 2019. And what these two laws basically do is tell a company that we own all the data on your network, we own your equipment. At any time we can come and request access to anything on your network to any of your users, that sort of thing. Of course, unencrypted because encryption is awful. And uh, we basically own uh, the data on your at your company. So, uh, you know, these two laws help push our policies uh, towards saying no to Huawei. And in response to this, Huawei actually filed a lawsuit in, through the state of Texas um, in May of 2019. And they basically said, you know, you can't do this. This is protectionist. Um, you know, we're, we're suing you like this is awful. And the U.S. government came back and they're like, well, you're a Chinese company, right? Chinese-based company. And they're like, yes. And they're like, are you aware of the regulation on internet security and the national intelligence law um, that China has? And they're like, oh, yes. And like, you know, you're aware that you do X, Y, and Z through this law. And they're like, yeah, that's what the law says. 
And the US government's like, and you as a Chinese company are in good standing with the government and you abide by the law. And they're like, oh yes, we're in good standing. And uh, the US government's like, so you're using, you're following these laws and you're gonna give up our data, uh, right? So that kind of falls under why we're, <clears throat> we're not letting you in. And Huawei's like, oh no, we don't do that. And so the lawsuit's still going on and it's kind of just a back and forth of that sort of dialogue, uh, which I think is pretty funny. Um, don't ask me to pronounce the Chinese characters at the bottom. That's just the translation of the, of the law name. Um, so that's one issue on one side and that's the national security issue. It's pretty straightforward. It's internal. However, another problem with um, uh, Huawei and the argument for it is geopolitics and costs. So like I said, it's cheaper equipment, which a lot of companies are really, that weighs heavily for them. But also we want to avoid tensions with China. So they view this law as protectionist, disguised as national security, or they say they view it that way. I don't think they're that dumb. But um, also countries besides the US rely on China economically. And I think this is a very uh, powerful issue that we really need to figure out where we stand in. Um, so a big example of this is in Africa. So the African Union is completely owned by uh, Chinese tech. So um, as you can see here on the right, you know, it's the plaque saying, we have a good relationship, we love China. Um, China basically subsidized all the telecom infrastructure in these countries in the African Union. They even funded a new headquarters for this alliance. Um, one thing that I thought was pretty funny was through this alliance um, and the infrastructure, Huawei actually, actually was caught exfiltrating data um, for a dictator in one of the countries um, about his opponent or something like that, so he could he could arrest him. And <clears throat> I think it was um, released through Citizens Lab or something like that. But you know, we we read about everyone read about this, and yet we still wonder if. Huawei is not exfiltrating data <laughs> or reading things in plain text. Um, and so no one seemed to care. So that was that was a great find. Um, but yeah, the African Union doesn't want to risk the relationship with China. And I think that's a, a pretty large problem. Um, a similar problem actually is in Mexico right now. Um, and so the Mexican government really doesn't want to hurt the relationship with China because they are getting such heavily subsidized equipment. And so that's why even though the US told Mexico, you can't have any equipment within a certain range of the border, um, they've started putting up Huawei equipment below that range, um, just because they feel like they kind of have to. All right, so that's the issue from policy or politics standpoint. There's a few issues also with the tech that they have. Um, so I like starting out this section by asking the audience if they know what 5G is, I won't do that here. But this is in general what people think 5G is, right? And this is what 5G actually is. Um, so this is just a simple block diagram of a base transceiver station. Um, and it shows the essential components that compri uh, comprise the transmit chain of the base station. And you can see here, it's not super fancy. Um, so what at the core, what is 5G? It's a millimeter wavelength technology. So the, the key element why 5G is so great is it uses these 30 to 300 uh, gigahertz wavelengths. Um, higher frequency means higher bandwidth. However, downside is it means it's just shorter range. Um, so that means everything, wireless modems, phones, everything that we need needs to be closer to these base stations. So the TLDR is we have to have more base stations. Um, even though the latency is less, um, we'll have to have more of these uh, small cells installed throughout an area. So historically 4G and, and before we have tall towers, right? You, you see them when you're driving down the road, very tall, very long range. That's great. Um, these small cells have a very short range. And so you might only get um, connectivity between one or two blocks of a, of a city area. Um, so obviously improvements are, you know, a few, we have better speed, compression, capacity. However, uh, coverage efficacy is a little bit more difficult. So we now have with 5G as with an elevation beam forming. So it means we get a better range, a better coverage. However, 
to make up for the lack of range for the uh, 300 to 300, 30 to 300 uh, millimeter wavelengths, we now have to add a second wavelength called a sub six gigahertz wavelength um, or that spectrum. And these are extremely large range uh, wavelengths that can go over large distances. Um, and one issue we have in the US uh, with developing 5G is that all of this entire spectrum, the sub six gigahertz uh, spectrum is currently set on by a company called Intelsat. Um, I wonder what they do. And uh, they can, they sit on it. So all of these um, wavelengths in the spectrum are currently owned by someone. So AT&T, Verizon, they can't use them. And so one thing that the US government just came out with actually uh, two weeks ago is a memorandum on, on 5G and how we're trying to push towards it. Um, and one of the things they explicitly mentioned there is we are working with the FCC to try and free up some of these wavelengths um, for our telecom companies. Um, and they also mentioned uh, the US government really wants to push private sector innovation in this area. So we don't want to become a China, right? And, you know, own the company or uh, subsidize them heavily, but we can help them in terms of freeing up wavelengths that they need or um, other things. Um, and then one other thing that I think is very different from 4G, or it is very different, is the IoT uh, capability. So now we can connect anything to our uh, base stations, right? Um, you know, which is cool, sure, but it also has its downfalls. Uh, so this is just uh, showing, you know, with 4G, we have one base station. With 5G, we have lots of base stations. Um, so there's not too much to add there. Uh, this is a picture of one of these small cell base stations from Nokia. Um, I think it's better looking than the Huawei base stations also, so I think that matters. I have to stare at it every day. Um, but these are the example of stuff they put up in cities. Um, and so I think another problem with 5G is that, sure, it works really well in very dense cities where you can put these small towers up every two blocks. Um, but in non-city center areas, not so great. Um, and so I think that's a problem with just how the US is laid out. Um, but a, a big problem, I think, from a security perspective, well, there are a few problems, but um, the big one is these 5G base stations are now no longer just a simple base station. Um, they actually run software like Docker, um, OpenSSL, uh, VMs. They, they run a bunch of things and they have a bunch of ports open. And the reason for that is they're basically an IoT device themselves. So they're remotely managed, they're remotely updated, um, and all of these management systems are hosted in the cloud. Um, in China, actually, in the case for Huawei 5G. Um, so, of course, you know, we'd have to give them continued access to our infrastructure um, for them to update and manage uh, these stations, make sure that everything's working as fast as it could be. Um, and so, between remote management and all these other systems on the device, as well as there's Telnet ports open, there was a bunch of junk on it. Um, and also stuff to allow for direct connectivity to the 5G base station. So things like your router connecting right to the base station on that sort of thing. So there's lots of services, lots of ports. You might, you know, it's like almost sounds like a CTF challenge, but maybe it isn't. Um, but there's lots of risks associated with having a system like this. So obviously they could backdoor their own device. Um, the device could be perfectly good, but a remote update could downgrade something or change something or accidentally open a port um, that introduces security critical changes. Um, so that's coming from what I think is a huge issue. But um, we also have the larger issue of federation of telecom infrastructure. So now an entire system would be owned and managed remotely um, by a third party country. So it makes it difficult for us not only to enforce things like data regulation, but also just to make sure that things run uh, when we need them to. And so people, you know, come out saying we're concerned they could be using these things for intelligence collection um, as pivots to other malicious activity. So you're sitting on the 5G box. Oh, look, the router is connected right to you. You can pivot right to the router, um, which is also maybe a Huawei router. You never know. Um, 
and uh, there's lots of different things that could happen, of course. Um, but from an economic perspective, I think one interesting side effect that could happen, maybe this is like a black swan sort of thing, um, is artificial prices from the Huawei 5G base stations. So remember, they're 30% lower, which is undercutting the entire world market by a lot. They could actually force competitors out of business. And so maybe in 10 years from now, the only provider would be them. And so now they control maybe everyone's access to a telecom infrastructure. Um, so I don't think this idea is that far-fetched, actually. I don't know if anyone's heard of a company called Nortel. Um, Nortel is a Canadian company, which no longer exists. You know, sad, sad for them. But uh, the reason they no longer exist is they were the first company to actually invent and you know, provide an actual working POC for 5G. Um, it just so happens that a lot of their data was you know, seen going across the network uh, to, the, uh, to the West um, or China, but I'm not saying anything there. Uh, but uh, they actually went out of business because all of their tech was stolen. Um, and I think this is a huge issue, not just for the telecom industry, but for other industries as well, right? And so uh, they went out of business. Uh, their tech now shows up inside of uh, inside of Huawei, and um, obviously it's been modified and, and added on since. Um, but they were forced out of business, and so um, it this shows that the company and um, the government subsidizing them they're not opposed to using tactics like this to push companies out of business uh, to help them dominate the market. Um, so it, one thing I like to say is. 5G is technically about better speeds, zero latency. Uh, at a global level, it represents political dominance and economic might uh, between countries. And so there's a lot of different cards at play here. Um, yeah, so long term, you know, we, we talked about this, but uh, they'd be embedded in our networks for de decades. You know, you don't think that 4G tower down the road has been moved, changed, or modified in, in, in a decade, right? So. Uh, they'd be along, around for a while. Um, obviously, there's issues with the setup that 5G currently has in rural areas as well. Um, and at at scale, we've never had a system like this that has so many uh, that would have so many IoT devices connected directly to it. And I think that's also kind of a scary paradigm shift that no one's really talking about. So. Obviously, there's lots of risks, and you know the UK and other countries are, aren't stupid, and they know there's a lot of risks. However, they want to make sure their their citizens have access to breaking edge technology. And so, one thing a lot of countries have done is they've tried to mitigate this risk um, through different policies. Um, so, this is just a, a brief overview of what the US has done in terms of critical infrastructure. Um, from a national security perspective, we haven't really done much in the way of telecom uh, policy um, in a long time. However, in 2018, one of the most critical bills was passed um, called the NDAA. And this is the uh, policy, or this is the piece of legislation that actually um, blocked lifting exports now for ZTE. So it, it kind of doubled down on our anti ZTE stance. Um, and it was, it was the start to banning federal purchase of Huawei and ZTE uh, infrastructure, which is a good start. And this is the piece of legislation that actually is, that is technically being sued through the state of Texas by Huawei US. Um, and this bill actually also includes other technologies. So I list them here, um, Hytera and um, Dahua Vision uh, Technology. So these other companies are also um, they don't align themselves with our national security interests. All right, so uh, critical infrastructure um, suppliers. So we have Ericsson and Nokia as alternatives to Huawei. Um, there's other countries as, or companies as well uh, that are trying to develop these capabilities. And so hopefully here in the US with the piece of legislation that was passed two weeks ago uh, to free up that sub six gigahertz wavelength um, we'll hopefully have other companies starting to um, produce and provide 5G technologies. Um, but yes, so one thing I think is 
the, a strong move uh, from countries is when they actually just ban a, co a company's sale um, of products in their country. However, the U.S. is the only one that's come out very strongly in this sense. Um, I kind of put this here just um, if people want to read more about this, um, the Lawfare blog post I wrote, um, there's a link at the bottom. Um, but looking at the mitigations from other countries, we can kind of categorize them in the CIA triad. So how can we preserve confidentiality, integrity, and availability? Um, and this was mentioned in the UK's proposed mitigations as well. Um, so, you know, one big uh, mitigation that countries have tried to um, state or put forward is, well, everyone can use a VPN. So maybe the network's compromised in the entire country, but maybe everyone can use a VPN. I think everyone should use a VPN anyway. Um, we'll see if, if that actually happens. Um, but their big thing here is to assume that the network is already compromised, which seems a little ridiculous to me. Um, but yeah, I, I think the problem with availability here and I think I mentioned this before, but nothing stops a vendor from turning off their service, especially if they own the entire country's um, telecom situation. And so the UK in response to this stated that, well, we'll only allow Huawei equipment for 30% of our infrastructure. And it should be the non-critical parts of the infrastructure. And I'm just like, well, you know, how are you going to determine that? But also everything's connected anyway, so it doesn't matter. But um, they proposed having backup equipment from a different vendor that if the Huawei equipment gets turned off, they can just put that in. Well, if you do that, you might as well use the backup vendor first, but I think that's a different problem for them. Um, so yeah, the use of the VPN slash using encryption doesn't solve confidentiality. So as we know, metadata is useful and this would be still very much exposed to the Huawei base stations. Um, Loss of integrity is still possible with encrypted data. And at the end of the day, why would you give an adversary that much of a foothold already? Um, but yeah, I think one important point here that they, the policymakers don't seem to understand when it comes to using encryption over an insecure network is encrypted channels are dependent on each device in the network. Um, and there's also transmits costs to, you know, to the consumer or to the user. So if you're using your mobile phone to connect, that sort of thing. Um, and network segmentation for critical communication is quite difficult um, in a real nationwide network like this. All right, so the UK's proposed mitigations boil down to lots and lots of code review and enhanced monitoring. monitoring. Um, and they wanna have different vendors for every chunk of the network, which I think in itself is a little silly, but um, code review, I think, was their strongest thing. And that's because the Huawei Cybersecurity Evaluation Center has been running for nine years. Uh, it's attached to GCHQ, and it has worked to continue to identify concerning issues in Huawei's approach to software development. Um, so basically, every year they read the code that Huawei gives them, and they said, okay, you have a thousand vulnerabilities here, fix them. Huawei has made no material progress on any of the issues presented to them um, since they, the inception of this com uh, team, um, especially in 2018, but there's been no patches put out to actually mitigate any of the vulnerabilities. And so they actually came out last year and said they have limited assurance that long-term te technical risks can be managed. So just from a purely technical standpoint, they don't think these devices are that great. Um, and we can't do proper risk management. And so reading through the report is quite funny. So you actually uh, get snippets like this. So it turns out that all Huawei code um, has macros defined, you know, safe library memcopy, which you'd think, okay, that's a great macro that probably, probably wraps around memcopy S. It does not. It just throws away the desk max uh, size and calls memcopy. Um, so if you're reading the code, you'll, you'd see safe library them copy and you'd say, oh, okay, it's probably safe. They probably use the desk max size. Uh, they do not. <laughs> so at compile time, you get a whole different set of functions that are actually put in the code. So um, they've actually wrapped around, wrapped safe mem copy um, with a, a macro called another mem copy. 
because it's just not that great, you know. So who wants to use safe mode coffee? Um, but even then, they if you guys can see at the bottom, another mem copy, they pass the same size in for both the desk size and the source size. So there's lots of problems with this code. Um, the funny thing here is someone had to put the extra effort in to write the macro and to, to put um, mem copy underneath it and you know, put this function in all the code. Um, so the funny thing about this is this didn't show up until 2018 when uh, this task force identified hundreds of overflow vulnerabilities. So their solution was to literally add this macro and wrap them and copy in it. Um, so I guess that's a, another layer of security through obscurity. So they should talk to Intel, but um, yeah, I think that's just, it hurts. It hurts to look at it. Um, another one was they have lots of open SSL libraries. So they have 14 copies um, spanning version from version 097 um, through 102. So they have lots and lots of different versions of open SSL. Um, which one is used where is very unclear if you actually read the code for this. Um, maybe you could do some dynamic analysis or something to figure it out. Uh, but even then, all of the copies or versions of the 14 are all vulnerable to something. Um, so that's always good. Uh, and so there's lots of problems with the code here. Um, like I mentioned before, there's telnet ports that were open um, on these devices. Uh, these boxes are basically like bad routers um, with lots more code and lots more features. Um, so one thing that I wanna say here, cause I get this question a lot. I understand that IoT devices are inherently insecure. And I'm not saying that Nokia's or Ericsson's 5G base stations are perfectly secure either, but these are exceptionally bad and they're not making any material progress to fix anything that was actually given them in terms of bugs and that sort of thing. Um, and one other thing to note is that while they're exceptionally bad, they're also entirely beholden to the Chinese government, which other companies are not. Um, so it's an interesting thought experiment. Um, and then one thing also is the, the UK is relying heavily on source code review. Source code review has shown to fail in the past. And so this is one example of this. So Huawei launched a laptop called MateBook um, middle of last year. MateBook, uh, working with Microsoft and that sort of thing, um, if you go to their website and download the firmware or the code um, and they're running Windows, um, Everything looks fine. However, when you open the laptop up and Windows Defender runs, uh, Windows Defender alerts on a Huawei driver, um, which allows remote uh, device management. Um, and this enabled access to the Windows 10 operating system, um, which is kind of like a backdoor hack, except it's kind of like a front door as well. Um, and the funny thing is, so Windows Defender found this and published it um, in March. Um, the U.S. had actually not trade banned this laptop at this point, but in June, Huawei removes this because so many people on the internet were talking about this backdoor. Um, they removed the laptop, citing the fact that the U.S. was looking to trade ban it. Um, we should have done it probably earlier, I think, but uh, this is just an example of the firmware can have lots of other features that the source code doesn't actually show. Um, and again, I love this picture so much. Um, but the, the key part here is, and we learned this with the super micro case, if you control the hardware and you control the firmware that's originally put on it, uh, you control the device. And it's extremely hard to uh, verify security for any stage of this process. Um, this is another one I like calling out. So this is the ASUS um, shadow, ha uh, yeah, shadow hammer attack. The interesting thing about this one, so this was a software update bug, so supply chain to the update server, you have to uh, downloaded something that was malicious. The interesting thing about this malware was that even though it got on thousands and thousands of devices, it only actually attacked 600 people, or it only actually launched its payload for 600 victims. And it did so when it found the correct MAC address on the victim's laptop. Now you might be wondering, 
how this piece of malware knew the MAC address of the different victims? That's a good question. Lots of people are wondering that too. Um, and it, it, it hints at having a backdoor or a leak or some sort of access at manufacturing time to the MAC address put on that computer. Um, so I think that's it's pretty suspicious. But uh, and then ShadowPad is another one. This was also a different server management um, update um, update backdoor. So the takeaways is risk management is not only impossible but ridiculous when it comes to these sort of things. Um, obviously, we, supply chains you know are, have a global risk and global impact, but policy policy decisions around this need to be informed with a complete understanding of technical issues. Um, so suggesting things like, oh, we'll only use it on 30% of the network, or we'll use a VPN. Uh, they just don't cut it when it comes down to this, this serious of a topic and this serious of technology. Um, one thing I want to point out as well is we should not be using national security issues like this telecom issue um, as a bargaining chip for trade. Um, and it undercuts, this undercuts the meaning of our bans and our statements against the equipment. Um, and this is, of course, not protectionism in disguise, which a lot of people argue that it is. Yep, so you can contact me on Twitter or email. Um, that's my handle on IRC or Slack. Um, I don't know if this would work. Um, I guess I could try it. So this is a... Um, I'm sure people have seen it. It's the video that Huawei came out with uh, two weeks ago, and they basically tried to redefine the word um, backdoor. And so they said, you know, backdoors aren't necessarily bad. This is a front door for law enforcement, and that's the, that was their number one argument uh, for for their devices. Yep. So I'll take any questions now or or in Discord later. Um, I think uh, various yeah. governments have tried to do similar things in the past, right? Like we uh, we used to call it Clipper. <laughs> <laughs> you do have uh, several questions. I was just going to say maybe you could post that link in uh, in the tracks uh, or in LobbyCon or something, and then people can find it. Um, but there yeah, are several see. questions that have uh, that have popped up. Let me see if I can uh, pull some up here. Posted in lobby town. Um, some of them are, are sort of tactical and some of them are strategic, you know, um, kind of questions. Um, so yeah, you got about, I don't know, eight if you want to scope your answers, of, you know, size them. Um, uh, so where the person questions? was saying, um, oh. <laughs> one person was saying, what can average people um, not trained in tech do to make sure that the hardware that they buy is safe? From back doors. That's tough. I mean, I think even if you're not, even if you are really good at tech, it's it's hard to do that. Um, I think the the biggest thing is just make sure you know the manufacturers in your supply chain. So not just the one person, the one company you talk to in China or other countries, but make sure you know. Okay, well, who do you get this part from, or who do you actually have fabricate this part of the the motherboard, or who do you go to to actually print the silicon? Because um, ninety nine percent of the time it's not in the house. Who's who? Who is asking those questions? Like you're not asking them, you know, at the Apple store. The the genius at the desk is not no, doesn't know the answers. Right? <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know if a consumer can do too much, but if you're a company and you're looking to purchase things, then you have a bargaining chip of I'm not giving you money unless <laughs> you tell me. Gotcha. So is the consumer beholden? Like you want to try and um, select companies that you trust to do such things or in your mind, is there some sort of um, I, I think agency you are, governing honestly. body to do this or something, you know? There's nothing much for hardware in my experience. I mean, prove me wrong, but um, I mean, I own an Apple uh, phone. It's right here. <laughs> this is has secure boot and other sorts of encryptions on it. Um, but yeah, the best you can do is really understand the device you're getting and, you know, trust the company to do a good job sourcing, uh, manufacturing. You heard it here. Sophia trusts Apple. <laughs> uh, two more questions, or a two-part question. Um, when you're talking about these sort of implants and backdoors, where, where does the financial motivation come from? 
surely it's not from the manufacturers themselves to do this. Are they being sort of coerced or bribed or incentivized by, um, you know, state actors? Um, is there some sort of profit model? So actually, I mean, I, I think you're right. Um, companies really don't care. If you see something coming from a company itself that's bad, it's probably just because it was cheaper to make the board that way. Um, mm -hmm. One actually interesting thing I did see was um, a company in a different country um, make, was making devices they wanted to sell both in the U.S. and in China. Um, and in order to get the sale in China to go through, they had to make um, the device in such a way that it wouldn't break, you know, the firewall, the network rules that they have. Um, so there was no uh, HTTPS anywhere, right? Um, they modified the way they did their updates as well um, to go to the server that was requested over HTTP. Um, there was a lot of problems with it. It looked very much like a backdoor. Um, and in reality, it was just them complying with the Chinese government to get a sale in their country. Now, is China using it as a backdoor to spy on their own people? I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but there's that sort of economic incentive too, right? So China won't do business with you unless you make your device a certain way or do what they tell you. So the culinary question to that, if you kind of, you know, you personally have seen something like that or you've seen the, the writings about something like that, um, how do those companies then respond to your research? You know, there's kind of like the bug bounty program side, but also if, if you know that that was an economic incentive, then the, the company is fundamentally aware already that they did that and your research is not, you know, shining a new light. So how do the companies react? Um, usually those things don't necessarily go public. Um, so you'd probably want to talk to the company or something, but I think for the most part, unless you can show them that they can make more money a different way, it's a hard argument. So. Okay. Until so like it becomes like a public opinion kind of issue or something larger. Yeah. Or if there's regulation against there or something. Mm -hmm. So if the U S had a regulation saying, you know, you have to have all of your network requests go over HTTPS, then we might win that side of the argument, but. Gotcha. Um, do you see any, um, you did a good job sort of detailing difficulties on supply chain management. Do you see any changes, um, in the, I guess in the U S do you see any sort of policy changes, um, affecting, uh, supply chain management or. Not really. So I know a few hedge funds here in the city know their supply chain pretty well um, because when you're making a board that can make you a lot of money, you don't want those specs to get leaked or anything like that. Um, but most of the time companies are doing it by themselves, usually kind of ad hoc. Um, the only real policy stuff that's actually come out for supply chain has been um, in these bans that we've seen. So um, you know, banning ZTE and supply chains are banning uh, certain Huawei stuff from federal supply chains. Um, so I think the real issue is that the government can make strong statements about federal or DOD supply chains, but oftentimes those policy decisions don't translate over into the public sector um, or the private sector, sorry. Um, totally due to economics. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. It's, I mean, it's very hard for them to make policy decisions about commercial things. Um, cause, because the way we set things up is, you know, the U.S. respects their companies pretty well to to operate independently. Yeah, I think um, maybe, maybe it's worth mentioning, I don't know, but you, you kind of think that um, on the surface, if you have to go to the extra effort to make a federal compatible piece of equipment, why don't you, then it would be cheaper to manufacture that one for everybody. But the reality is that that's not true. The extra the extra onus on the federal gear um, is is much more expensive typically. Well, and the other huge issue we have right now is we don't have um, uh, the proper fabs we need in the United States. We literally don't have I think it's an eight millimeter uh, chip fab. Um, basically, we can't make chips as small as we need to as cheap as we would want. But we just literally don't have a factory for it. Um, I think there might be one like test factory up uh, upstate New York, but right. nowhere else. 
not real production level. Uh, yeah. We're, we're kind of over, but there's one more question that I think is uh, relatively mm -hmm. detailed and maybe to, you'd appreciate going towards the weeds a little more. Um, well, x-rays work now. Uh, could, in theory, the sub nanometer components um, thwart detection? Like, how are we going to see this stuff in the future? And then they're, they're, they kind of posit, the, the person asking the question kind of posits that um, while this is reaching a bit, you know, maybe the advent of quantum computers, um, is there a design that could take advantage of quantum tunneling or entanglement or something, um, again, in order to sort of thwart detection? Well, the answer to the second one is yes. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think there's a whole lot of possibility in that area for different types of attack. Um, the problem with x-rays is already being felt, actually. So I think I, I mentioned on um, my slides about you know the sandwich attack or the 3D chip um, attack with you know Intel's chip. Even at that layer, x-rays are almost unusable to detect um, different through silicon vias uh, and that sort of thing. So just because of the way they operate, unless you you know de-layer it and just take top-down pictures, um, which you know is a different problem itself, but X-rays don't necessarily help you detect that. Um, and it would even get harder if there are sub-nanometer components. Because um, it turns out x-rays just really aren't that great <laughs> for really small devices. So, Not a perfectly suited uh, technology. Well, um, thank you again for, uh, for keynoting and for doing it virtually in this uh, sort of uncertain time. Um, I think a lot yeah, of the, due to the questions, I think a lot of people enjoyed it. And you're going to stick around in Discord a little bit? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, anyone just PM me on Discord and ask questions. Yeah, so uh, Sophia's got the speaker chat. tag. Uh, so she's blue. I think it's uh, Q U A N D. Uh, uh, Q U E N D. Sorry, Q U E N D. Uh, in uh, Discord. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of questions that uh, we didn't get to if you want to um, tag through the, the talk tracks. Um, otherwise, people can hit you up in, in the, uh, the hallway or in the lobby or wherever. Yeah, I, if I didn't respond to you in, in a little bit, just maybe it's if you have to at me or something. If I may have missed it. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, so we're going to do uh, just a short break here, and then we're going to split off into the two different tracks. Uh, the agenda is on the website, and um, we'll see you guys soon. <laughs>